This is one of the scariest experiences that has ever happened to me. Even simply by writing this, it brings back so many nightmares. And it reminds me as to why I will never go camping again. I had been attending Camp Rock Water for about four years now. I used to love camping, being able to see some new faces, getting to do fun and exciting activities. My favorite was the river rope swing. I never wanted to leave that swing once I got on. I was just so excited to go back, mainly because it would be my last year I went. And then summer finally came, and it was finally time to go camping. When I got to camp after a four hour car ride, I was so excited. I was remembering all my old favorite places. First things first, my mom had to take me to the lodge to get signed up. When we got into the lodge, there were a lot of people there. We waited in line until it was our turn to sign up. Before we were handed any papers, the lady at the table told us that there had recently been some weird things going on a few miles down through the woods from us. I just brushed it off and ignored it. I think I was just too excited to finally be able to go to camp again. My mom helped me lug my suitcase to the cabin. When we got there, I was so happy to see some old friends from last year. Kyle was one of my longtime camp friends. He was sitting in the corner making his bed. Jacob, another one of my really good friends, was on the floor taking stuff out of his bag. And who could forget about Brad? He was putting stuff in the closet, like baseball bats and golf clubs. As for the other two kids, I had no idea who they were, but they both seemed to like me. It turns out they were brothers. Their names were Brandon and Nathan, and it being their first year here, they were kind of nervous. We all got settled in, and after our parents left, we sat down and started talking about past adventures in camp. It wasn't for another hour that our cabin leader arrived. When he got in, he kind of looked at us all with a gloomy face. He turned to us and said, Hey guys, I'm your cabin leader for the next two weeks. Now, before we do anything, I have to tell you that some things have changed and we will have to be more cautious due to the weird things that have been happening. We all were a little uneasy, but we wouldn't let that stop us from having the best summer ever. The day continued on as normal. We introduced ourselves, played some cards in our cabin, went outside, and played basketball. Went to the mess hall to eat, and came back to the cabin to sleep. It was kind of strange that there were only six cabins full of people, when there was always around 30. So the next day we woke up, it was raining hard. The sounds of the rain smacking the metal roofs of the cabins echo off to the distance. The camp leader was nowhere to be found. So we kind of sat around the middle of the cabin, just waiting for our cabin leader to get back. We then started talking about some ghost stories that happened around the camp. Some of them seemed completely stupid, but others were kind of scary. And just to let you all know, Outside of our cabin, there were about 400 acres of woods. In those woods, there were some obstacle courses, the chapel, and the river. There was one more thing in the woods that nobody really knew about, because it was so far off. It was the original Camp Rock water cabins. There were only a few of the older cabin leaders that knew about it and how to get to them. They say that back in the early 1900s, when the camp was first established, two kids got into a fight in their cabins and one kid killed the other in his sleep. He had apparently taken a heavy rock and dropped it on the other boy's head. Legend has it that the presence of the boy who was killed is seen walking around the old campground and chapel. They say that the boy can sometimes be seen crying at the back of the chapel Someone even said they went to the cabins and saw his head peeking out from one of the windows. At this point, everyone in our cabin was really scared. I swear, Brad was going to have a panic attack. That's when our camp leader came rushing in through our cabin door. 
He told us that we needed to pack our things and go to the lodge. We would have to call our parents in the morning to tell them to take us home. We walked all the way from our cabin to the lodge in the rain, completely wet. When we got there, only four other cabins had been there. As I was sitting next to the fireplace with my cabin mates, we overheard people talking about what was going on. Someone had said that all of cabin six had gone missing after returning from the chapel. The conversations after that got really boring that we ended up falling asleep in the lodge. Later that night, I woke all of my friends. I wanted to go and check out what happened in the woods. Call me stupid all you want. But mind you, I was also younger. Though at first all of my friends didn't want to go, they still agreed to tag along with me. We grabbed a few flashlights and snuck past the cabin leaders that were sleeping near the exit. When we got outside, it was still raining, but now it was also pitch black outside. This still didn't stop us from heading over to the woods. When our group finally got to the mouth of the woods, Brad and Jake just couldn't do it. They walked back to the lodge through the shortcut in the gardens. All that were left were Kyle, Brandon, Nathan, and I. We walk slowly through the path that leads to the chapel. Every now and then, we would trip over some uprooted trees, but we still kept going. We could see the chapel ahead of us, but we knew there was something wrong. It was very quiet. The rain had stopped too, and there was no wind, nor any kind of animal in sight. As we walked up to the chapel, Brandon who was carrying one of the flashlights, just started screaming. He then ran as fast as he could back towards camp and dropped his flashlight. The light was shining through the chapel, and I kid you not, through one of the windows, we saw the face of a child crying. That's when we all screamed and started to run towards the camp as well. Out of fear, we lost all sense of direction and had no idea where any of us were. As we came up to the ravine that led down to the river, that's where we saw in the pitch darkness a silhouette of a small black figure that was blocking our way. Our only way out was taking the ravine. Nathan, Kyle, and I began going down the side of the ravine and we noticed another figure. That's when I shot my flashlight down a ways and there was Brandon just lying dead with his head smashed in. Blood everywhere. To be honest though, it seemed like he had tripped maybe on an uprooted tree and fell down the side of the ravine but we had to just keep running so we left him there. We were halfway down the ravine when we could feel the sweat falling into our eyes like ocean water. And there it was again, the figure of a little boy standing at the end of the ravine, waiting for us to play with him. I told everyone just to keep running. And that's when I looked behind us and Nathan had disappeared. He was no longer with us. I'm not sure if he took another way or ended up running a different path or back, but he was completely gone. Kyle and I kept running, and that's when I saw the old stairs coming up to our left that led back up to the back part of camp. When we got to the stairs and we were almost to the top, that's when we could hear a kid saying, we can play with the rocks. We didn't even stop to look back. We ran all the way to the lodge When we got there, all of the cabin leaders had been away. Two other cabins had left to go investigate what was going on in those woods. They both went missing. And then Kyle finally spoke up. Even though he hadn't said anything all night, he did say, I saw him. The boy just wanted to play with us. And that was it. The next morning, Our parents picked all of us up, and we never went back again. Years have passed since that encounter. Kyle was booked into a mental hospital. 
They said for some serious mental issues that he had going on. Jake and Brad were never found and nobody ever mentioned anything about them after that day. As for the other three cabins of kids, nobody ever found out what happened or where they went. Maybe nobody cares. But I will tell you this though, after this experience, I have never, nor will I ever, go camping again. When I was younger, around 14 or 15 years old, my family used to camp at a state park. Every night, my friend and I would walk through the woods. We would call this the ritual. On this night, we decided to walk further into the woods than usual. Of course, we had flashlights, which would help us navigate through the woods. Part of this ritual was to turn them off as we walked through the night. We were about half a mile from the nearest campsite when we heard soft whispering behind us. Obviously, we hit the flashlights and spun around. We didn't see anything, so we kept walking, and then we hear it again. This time, we stop and look around before we decide to head back to our campsite. Then, we see what's whispering. It's a woman crawling on the ground, whispering just random words. What she was wearing was all black and she was covered in dirt. When she sees that we notice her, she stands up and says that she is looking for her campsite. We ended up walking her back to the campground and tried helping her find her group. It turns out she was just super drunk, high, and got lost trying to find a bathroom. Her friends didn't even notice that she was missing, and if we didn't go that far into the woods that night, we would have been lost all night. It's pretty creepy now that I think about it. Imagine a lady crawling around, whispering, saying things to herself. Some things in the woods are just very strange. Either way, this is just something really creepy that happened, and I won't ever forget it. I live in a small town surrounded by mountains and a forest, so camping is almost a weekly event, even in winter. The one camping trip that I can't forget is when me and my friend broke off from our group, which were other 16 and 19 year olds, to camp by a better fishing spot about a mile away. We only brought one tent for the group. I couldn't sleep because I had the feeling something was watching us. I assumed it was a mountain lion, which isn't that big of a deal, considering their behavior. So I just forgot about it and threw some more logs on the fire. I looked up from the fire and under the light of a full moon, that's when I saw it. There was a man standing at the edge of the clearing, about 80 yards away. I was frozen and couldn't take my eyes off him while he just stared back. He walked off in the opposite way after about a minute or two. I doubt he had any good intentions, but I sat there holding my friend's firearm throughout the night. I went on a group camping trip in the middle of nowhere in Arizona, only to awake and hear something sniffing the outside of our tent. My first reaction was that it was likely a bear or some animal that came across our sight and just maybe my dumbass friends didn't tie up the garbage. Seconds later, I can hear the sniffing go to the tent next to ours and everyone in mine grabs one another quietly to acknowledge that we're all awake and we're aware of what's happening outside. Then, a friend in another tent popped out and started to scream and make noise, hoping it would scare off whatever animal was in our sight. Turns out though, 
It wasn't an animal. It was some guy who had gone through our coolers and also decided that it would be okay to sniff our tents. Our friend chased them off and we quickly packed all of our stuff and left. The creepiest thing that has ever happened to me was when I was camping with my best friend. We were in a semi-remote camping area, drivable usually to get to it, but definitely only with a 4x4. It was a semi-maintained camping area, as in there were a couple of fire pits and just a few picnic tables that were starting to rot. So we get there and we start setting up when my friend wanders over to that outhouse and opens the door. He stands there for a second or two and then closes the door and goes to the second one, goes in and comes out a few minutes later. He comes back to me and just tells me to go check out that first one. I assume someone shit on the floor or an animal got stuck in there and perished or something. I was wrong. Three full backpacks and I am talking big bags like the bag I have that I use for week long trips. So of course we're nosy. We opened them up and two are full of good quality gear. Nothing unusual. The third is full of Skittles, bulky bags, small bags, tropical, sour, just about every flavor and size of bag you can imagine. Just full of Skittles. We ended up camping for about four days and we never saw a soul. The bags were still there when we left. We let the authorities know when we got to civilization, but the whole thing was just very weird. We went to Guatemala with my girlfriend. We did a three day hike through the jungle to Tikal. We slept in a tent at two tiny ranger campsites deep in the woods. During the second night, a massive thunderstorm was coming down above us. At 4 a.m., I woke up and heard some male voices and left the tent to check them out. Two guys with rifles approached me. I told my girlfriend to stay in the tent because, of course, it's scary. She didn't comply and joined me. Turns out those guys were local hunters looking for shelter in the camp. I did offer them coffee. They were more than happy. About 30 seconds later, the storm got so intense that a huge tree ended up falling and it fell right into our tent. If I had not left to check out the guys, or even worse, if my girlfriend would have listened to me, we would have both been dead by now. My dog lost it on a nice hike one day, like she was scared for her life, and she would have ran into the woods had she not been tied. It was luck that she didn't pull me over and run away. My mother and I are pretty sure that there must have been a mountain lion stalking us and the dog ended up smelling it. It's scary now that I think about it because we didn't see anything. And if it had been one of us alone, who knows what would have happened. So we end up playing football, digging around with me. There's the white kid Tanner, five of my cousins, and then four of their friends. In total, there were five girls and six boys. We all were around 15 to 17. We ended up just digging the day away. So we head back to the camp and pulling out some stuff for a campfire. Even though the trailers had kitchens, Tanner says that his family's property sits up against my uncle's. He wants to run home and ask his dad if he can come out camping with us. My cousin Rooster says he's going to go with him since it's going to get dark soon. And one of the girls also wants to tag along. It's about 7 o'clock and it's starting to get pretty dark. 
They take flashlights and take the trail to Tan's property. The rest of us chill. We make s'mores, drink, and kiss on the girls. About 30 to 40 minutes later, there's the smell of ozone again. You could smell it over the smell of the fire we had started. It was a nasty copper smell like right after you had a nosebleed and it stopped. It wasn't exactly like dry blood, but it was that nasty metallic back of your throat smell kind of. We immediately think it's some kind of electrical malfunction or someone left a hot plate on or some shit like that. We search all the trailers and nothing is on and we can all smell it now. All of a sudden, we can hear people booking down the path towards us and Rooster, Tan, and the girl all come running into the clearing out of breath. And they don't even break stride. They all run into the trailer right by where the fire is. So of course, we all get the fuck out of there and into the trailers we go as well. They end up calming down. Even Rooster is crying his fucking eyes out at this point. All the while, the fire is going lower and lower. So my cousins say, fuck it. And they're about to go outside to get the generator out of a shed between the trailers. But then Tanner goes, fuck no, lock the front door. Ain't nobody else going outside. He's been crying too, and his eyes are bloodshot and puffy, and his pants are dirty as shit. He goes on to tell us that they went up to his house. His father said sure, he could go out camping, but to make sure they were careful on the way back, and that maybe they should take one of the hunting rifles, just in case. Evidently, Tanner had seen something in their yard a few days before. One of their pigs had come up, ripped up, and was half eaten. They assumed it was just some big cat or coyote, even though they usually don't fuck with live animals. He had gone upstairs and packed the stuff and told his dad they would be okay without the rifle because coyotes avoid people. So they started walking back to where we were camping at. So Rooster finally stops crying and shaking. The girl already had, but she was just staring out the window with a dumb look on her face. He says they had gone halfway into the woods towards the camp when they started to hear shit in the forest. It was almost pitch black by this time so they weren't sure at first what the fuck it was. The girl says that she heard something in the bushes right off the trail and they all beamed their flashlights over there and there was someone standing back in the woods. Rooster said they shouted at him and told him that he was scaring the fuck out of them and what a dick he was. He says that's when he realized that the guy was actually facing away from them. So they keep walking they say that they look off into the forest on the opposite side and there's a dude standing in the forest backwards slightly closer to the path so now they start power walking and Tan keeps going I should have taken the fucking rifle as they're telling the story the smell is still super strong even inside the cabin they say that after they started walking faster a kind of low gibbering has started coming from both sides of the woods. And as they started booking it back to the trailer, the girl said she had flashed her flashlight out into the woods to the side of them and had seen something jerking itself through the woods. The gibbering just got louder and louder and when they could see the light from our campfire, something had come out of the woods about 40 yards behind them onto the track. And that's when they just flat out ran as hard as they could to the trailer so we're out in the fucking woods and we're assuming at this point it's some rednecks or some shit trying to fuck with us all of a sudden my other cousin junior starts going on about how he went to school with a native kid that was telling him about the goat man or some shit like that we promptly tell him to shut the fuck up because we don't need any spooky talk right now but he just keeps going on and on about how it's the fucking goat man and how we're in his woods and blah blah blah. At that time, I had never heard of this goat man or any of that. But then a couple years ago, the year before I graduated from college, I had a native roommate and I ended up asking him about it. And to sum it up, it's basically a fucking man with the head of a goat and he gets among groups of people to scare them. 
it's also supposed to be kind of like the Wendigo. And it's bad mojo to even talk about it. And it's even worse if you see it. Keep in mind, I don't know this back when I was 16. So my cousin starts saying, the goat man's going to get in and fucking get us. The girls are all terrified. And my cousins and I are all fucking trying to figure out if it's just some bullshit or some hillbillies or some animal. So all of a sudden, the smell just goes away. Like to this day, I haven't even experienced anything like it. Most of the time, smells fade away or just lessen. But in this case, it literally was there one second and then not the second after. So it's after an hour making it around 9 or 10. We stopped shitting bricks enough to go back outside and stoke the fire again. We figured it was just some assholes trying to fuck with us. So we don't go back home because we think if we do, they'll chase us through the woods or some crazy shit like that. Nothing else weird happens that night and we stay another night and for the main part of the night, nothing happens. At about 1 in the morning, we're outside getting drunk and telling ghost stories. As someone is finishing their scary story, which I don't remember what it's about, the smell comes back. This time, it's so fucking strong that one of the girls literally starts vomiting. I stand up and you can actually feel how clammy the air is. I then say that we should get inside and this doesn't feel right. In reality, we should have just fucking left. We all go back inside and we're standing around. My cousin just keeps going on about how it's the goat man. And my cousin Rooster keeps trying to shut him the fuck up. And all the while I'm just feeling that something is wrong. And I can't figure out what the fuck it is. We end up sitting in there for a while. The smell is just as strong. And we're terrified and all huddle in this camper. We end up cooking brats for everybody because nobody wants to go outside. It's one of those packs with four brats. We have a total of three packs. I grill them up on the stove and give everybody a hot dog. I get mine and after a while, one of my cousins gets up and goes over to the pot to get another one. He starts grumbling about how I get two brats and everybody else only got one. And I look at him like he's fucking stupid. I tell him that everybody only got one because there were only 12 brats. If he wants more, he should open up a new pack and cook some more. That's when the girl that had been out with Rooster and Tan just starts screaming. Oh Jesus. Oh Lord. Get it out. She's crying and shivering. And then it dawns on the cousin standing up what the fuck is wrong. Me and him both glance around the room. And then I feel my heart fucking sink. I run the fuck out of the cabin and the girl runs out with us. The trailer door is banging against the side of the trailer as everybody books out of the cabin. One of my cousin's friends then asks what the fuck was wrong. I start counting all of us and there's only 11 of us now. I shit you not, my cousin verified. There had been 12 people in the cabin, but being that everybody didn't really know each other well, nobody had really noticed the whole fucking time that there was an extra person and then I realized earlier that I had kind of noticed something was off you know how when you're just dicking around having a good time that you don't sweat the smallest shit and you don't always keep track of certain stuff I'm dead sure that someone else had been in the trailer with us and that they had been there for at least a fucking day eating with us what makes it worse is I could figure out which one because I don't think anyone ever actually interacted with the other person slash the goat man. The girl kept praying to Jesus and we're all sitting outside. Eventually, we get big ass sticks and go back in the cabin, but there's nobody in there. We count again and there's 11 people. We go back into the trailer and lock the door. We explain what the fuck happened and the girl says that she also realized and that when he was about to say something, the person sitting next to her had grabbed her leg hard and leaned over towards her and said something she couldn't understand. So we are pretty much scared as fuck as we huddle together and I fall asleep. When I wake up, the sun is just coming up and half the people are asleep and the other half are packing our shit up. We all want to walk back home 
but like four people want to stay until the sun is all the way up and some people think that we're just fucking around and still want to stay there. I just want to get the fuck out of the woods to be honest. The girl's name was Kiara, the one that the goat man had touched. Anyways, I asked her if she really thinks it was something bad and she says that she just wants to go home and she doesn't want to be out in the woods alone for another night. So we decided to split up. The four that want to go can go, but I have to stay because I have the keys to the cabin and it's my uncle's and I have to lock up. I'm super pissed off at this point because I feel like people aren't taking the shit seriously and I definitely didn't want to be out in the woods for another night. I spend the rest of the day trying to convince the rest of the people, which is now four girls and four guys, to get the fuck out. Tanner leaves with them to go get a rifle and says he's going to be back. So now there are just seven of us left by 4 p.m. At around 5 p.m. he hasn't made it back yet and we're getting extremely fucking nervous. And the only reason I stopped begging them to go back was because he went to go get a gun. It's about 5.30 p.m. or so when the one cousin that did stay says that the girl Kiara is outside. We all look outside and sure enough she's standing by the fire pit with her back to the cabin. I'm thinking to myself if she was so fucking scared why the hell would she come back? And then I get this nasty feeling in my gut. Keep in mind the whole time the coppery smell has been gone. Now I realize I can smell just a little bit of it. I say this to the rest of them and everybody. And these are the people that wanted to stay in the fucking woods after we had the goddamn goat man in our midst. It's laughing at me and asking if I set this up to scare them. I'm looking at them like I'm not fucking bullshitting you all right now. I then demand to know why the fuck would I play like that. So one of the girls goes outside to get Kiara. She gets halfway to her and stops cold. Kiara starts heaving. I don't know how the fuck to describe it. Sort of like if someone with their back turned was laughing without actually making any sound. It was this fact that made me realize there was not a fucking sound in the whole woods. It was dead silent. This was like later in September so it was still fairly hot at the time but it was super chilly some days too and you could usually hear some big ass geese honking or some kind of birds or squirrels chit chatting. So I step out of the door and tell her to come back in the fucking trailer. Right fucking now. She backs up into the trailer and we lock the fucking door. We pull down all the shades except one and put a guy there in a chair to watch her. She stands there for another 20 minutes or so. The guy then turns to say that she's still there and then there's a huge fucking bang at the door. We all jump the fuck up and scramble around the living room. The banging is super fucking loud. So now my cousin is holding one of the girls and the other two are kind of giggling, nervously laughing and me and the other two guys are shitting bricks. Then we hear Tan, he's screaming, let me the fuck in, stop fucking playing. So we go over to the door and open it and he stumbles in with a rifle. There's nobody else outside. Evidently, he had walked up to the campsite. Nothing weird happened in the forest, but he had seen a girl, mind you. He said it was not Kiara standing there. When he had gone into the edge of the clearing, she had turned towards him with a slack jaw look and just stared him down, slowly tracking him as he walked around the outside of the clearing towards the camp. He said it was until he was almost halfway to the trailer he had realized that she was getting closer to him. She had started off by the fire and without him even seeing her move, she had been turning inches closer. He said he just ran the rest of the way back to the cabin thinking it would open and when he got to the door it was locked. He turned and it was about half the distance to the door. He looks around the room and then gets super pale. He pulls me to the side and whispers in my ear, you know there are only seven of us in here, right? I get that feeling where your stomach drops to your nuts. It had been back inside a trailer while we were out sorting now who was going where and then when we all went outside to talk earlier in the day. 
it has just slipped right back in. We looked out the window and there is nobody out there. So we recount everyone and then basically I go over and ask everyone how many people were here earlier and everybody says eight. I then say, well, how many are here now? They all do the count and then realize there are only now seven people in the cabin. So Tan had brought back a couple of boxes of ammo and his rifle and he had told his dad there was some kind of animal in the forest because he didn't think his dad would believe him if he said it was the goat man. He said that his cousin is supposed to be coming down in a few hours and that in the morning we can all go back to his place and his cousin will drive us home. Now I'm really fucking terrified but I at least feel better because we can be American and shoot the fuck out of whatever it is if it comes back. But then my cousin gets into this huge argument with one of the girls because she thinks that I'm trying to be funny and prank them and that she's getting really scared and that I'm not funny. He keeps telling her I'm not that kind of person and she says, well, how do we know the girl wasn't just Tanner in a wig or if it's really the goat man? How do we know that this is real? How do we know that this is the real Tanner and that the goat man just didn't kill Tanner in the woods and take his gun? So we fucking get into a huge argument about this where me and Tanner are like, we could seriously be in danger because at the very least someone has been sneaking themselves into our fucking trailer without us knowing and mingling with us. And at worst, something bad is in the forest fucking with us. One of the girls starts crying and saying that she wants to go home right now. And we're trying to tell her that we shouldn't because none of us are walking through the woods in the middle of the night. At this point, the sun is starting to go down and it's getting a little cloudy outside. We eat something and turn on the radio for a while, but we really can't get a station out there with anything decent. So we turn it off at about the time that Tan's cousin shows up. He was like 19, I think. At this point, the sun is just barely over the horizon and he has one of those heavy duty lantern flashlights and another rifle. He walks up to the trailer and we whisper to Tan, asking him if he's sure that's his cousin and he says, yes. The guy looks behind him and all around the camp, then walks in. He kind of glances at all of us and looks a little confused. He says, where's your other little buddy at? I figured she would meet up at the cabin. Is she a little slow or something? He also asked whether we had been cooking blood in the cabin because it smelled like blood and hot pants all the way up the trail. We all say at the same time, fucking no, but we ask him what the fuck he's talking about with the girl he saw. He had come down the same trail Tan had been using and he had come up on one of your guy's buddies standing in the middle of the trail, looking at him, slack jawed. He had asked her a bunch of questions, but all she did was just look at him. Then she smiled at him and he said he kept walking. She couldn't seem to keep up with him and kept lagging a little behind him. He said he asked her if she was hurt or something and if she needed any help, but she just continued to stare. Eventually, he had been walking and turned around a bend in the trail, but when he turned around and went back to see if she was okay, the trail was empty. So he assumed that she must have taken a shortcut through the woods to our trailer. We tell him the whole story of what's been going on I half expected him to say we were full of shit, but he just listened and then sat down on the couches in the living room. Tanner's cousin gets back to the girl, he says, when she had kept trying to lag behind him, it had kind of weirded him the fuck out, so he tried to keep her in front of him, but no matter how slow he walked, she was always lagging a little bit behind, and that he smelled this nasty smell and it got stronger as he got to the camp. Eventually it got really strong, she had said something really low that he didn't catch and when he had turned around she had been right the fuck up on him and he stepped back from her. It was at this point he asked her if she was okay and if she wasn't he would carry her back the rest of the way but instead she stayed quiet and just kept staring. He said that's when he reached out for her as in to grab her on the shoulder but he must have misjudged the distance because she was off to the side where he had put his hand like she had moved while he was looking dead at her. 
So at this point, we know the shit's real, unless Tan is playing a joke. Which, we can tell he's not because he's almost pissing his pants. So they load up their rifles, we eat some more, and we just kind of sit around until about 11. To this fucking day, every time I think about this, I really pray to God that it's not some huge prank that my cousins played on me and just never revealed, so I was shit for the rest of my life. At around 11, the stink of copper turns into an actual nasty, gross, blood-like smell. Like cooking blood and hair. Tan and his cousin Reese get the fuck up instantly and grab the rifles. There's like a half knock, half claw at the door. And I shit you not, there's this voice. And it sounds like when you see those YouTube cats and YouTube dogs whose owners teach them how to quote talk. So after the half knocking and half clawing at the door... It says in this weird toned voice, let me the fuck in, stop fucking playing. It made my fucking nuts creep up against my body. And one of the girls just starts crying and calling on Jesus. It was so fucking obviously not a person talking. It didn't have the right cadence. And that's some shit that I never realized until that moment. But all the people have a certain cadence when they talk, no matter what language. All people have a certain kind of rhythm to talking. This shit didn't have any kind of cadence. One of those YouTube cats, that's what the fuck it sounded like outside the door. So now I'm in full on terror mode. We keep yelling outside, who is it? Stop fucking around man. And just keep saying, let me the fuck in. For almost about 15 minutes. Let me the fuck in. Let me the fuck in. Let me the fuck in. But if you can't imagine how this shit sounded, then you can't imagine how fucked up the whole situation was. So then the smell goes away for a while, and for the next hour or so, you can hear someone basically creeping around in the woods. Every couple of minutes, it comes back into the door and says something. Finally, when the smell fades away, it's around 2 in the morning. Ree says, Man, fuck this and opens the door and walks outside with his rifle. He fires a shot into the air and says something to the effect of, in the name of Jesus Christ, go away, go away. He fires two more times, but then from the woods, right up against the river, across from the trailer, there comes this sound, like a slowly gibbering and hooting sound. Then it starts screaming and it sounds almost like a woman and a cat in a bag screaming together. Like, I seriously have never heard any shit like that. Reese fires into the tree line and then starts backing into the house. We lock the door and we can hear the shit keening and screaming. Reese says something had come out of the bushes, super low to the ground and crawling towards the cabin. He had shot at it, but pretty much that was how the rest of the night went. It was literally screaming constantly for the next two hours and we could hear shit moving out into the tree line, but it never came back up to the cabin until everyone had finally fallen asleep. Tan had been sitting in the chair watching the door with his rifle. Nobody else heard or saw this, and he told me two days later after the whole thing was over. He said he had been nodding off after the screaming and noises finally stopped, and he had been almost asleep when he saw someone come out of the bathroom and then lay down in the middle of the floor and go to sleep. He just assumed it was one of us and he had nodded off. Then he said he kind of realized something was wrong and while pretending to be sleeping, he counted us. There were nine people in the cabin. He basically didn't want to try to shoot at the fucking thing in the cabin and have it kill us all then and there or have Reese wake up and start shooting and then we kill ourselves. So he just stayed awake all night pretending to be asleep. He said sometimes it would stand up and kind of do this weird jittery thing or heave like it was laughing but then it would lay back down. The story closes pretty weak because from my perspective nothing happened. We woke up and I noticed that Tan was a little jittery and that he was avoiding looking at all of us. But we ate some breakfast, packed up and started walking to his house. 
He stayed last in the cabin, and he would lock up and bring me my uncle's keys to just start walking and he would catch up, which I didn't really want to fucking do. When we got a little bit up the path, and when he came running up, basically, we just jogged back to his house. His cousin took us home. There was a window in the bathroom. We were too stupid to lock a screenless window. The window was fucking up when he went in there. Now as you can imagine, I'm guessing, it must have been doing that all night. Waiting for us to fall asleep, or slip up, and then getting in among us. As a matter of fact, it walked with us all the goddamn way back to his house. And then he said, it lagged to the back of the group and looked him dead in the eyes before walking back into the woods. My grandfather told me a story once as we sat around a campfire in his backyard in the cool night of the Arizona desert. The horizon was clear and each star twinkle in a purple sky with a full fat moon hanging low over the mountains. His voice was raspy, the result of a lifetime of smoking cigars and drinking whiskey. The fire danced and shined across his wide dark eyes as he settled into his seat, ready to tell his story. Way back when I was a boy, about your age, I lived outside a reservation with your great grandfather. He had returned from the war and set about raising horses and cattle on a 100 acre ranch saddled between a brambly mountainside with good dirt for growing thorn brush and not much else. One night, my mother was sick and Pa and I took a trip into town about 50 miles away, straight through a dry desert over a washed out creek and some old abandoned farmsteads. Pa and I were driving in an old Ford pickup truck. I remember it was dark out, inky and thick with only the lights of our old truck lighting up the road. I remember it so much. The engine began to sputter and the truck slowed to a jerky stop. Damn it, Pa said, guiding the Ford to the side of the road. As it coasted to a stop, my Pa said, stay here, son, and he stepped out into the darkness, shutting the door with a heavy thud. My window was down and the cool desert air was breezy and felt good on my hot face and neck. Paul was getting water from the back to cool down the engine and that's when I smelled it. Rotten eggs. Strange, I thought, to smell sulfur in the desert. My nose also picked up the smell of one of those dead bloated cattle that would drop from the heat and lay there until the crows pecked enough holes in their hide to cause the whole thing to explode. It stunk and I gagged. My skin started to tingle too. The back of my neck felt itchy and my face started to get very hot. The wind stopped blowing with the stink filling the cab. Pa, I called out, no answer. My heart started beating and I felt such a fear in me, in my bones, in my chest. I tell you, I never felt fear like this. Not until Vietnam. Not until I saw men dying around me. I locked the door and reached over for my pa's door and saw a shadow bound across the road through both dim beams of light across the partly open hood. Grandfather paused telling the story. He spit a fat piece of tobacco to his side and he looked very pensive into the darkness. I realized I was holding my breath and gasped for air. The night was breezy, but I was sweating and clammy. What about your father? What did you see? My grandfather, continuing the story, sighed. A creature. He shook his head. You have to understand, there were legends. Old legends. Much older than what's out there in the valley. 
older still than Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, then the old chiefs and their shamans, the Apache and Hopi and Cherokee and all them old tribes and first peoples. They told tales. They told stories about dark magic. Something about a deal made with the old spirits of blood sacrifice to gain power, old power, enough to fight each other and the Spaniards and later the white man that came for their land and women they called them he paused grandfather took a deep breath and looked towards the fire to the sky the desert the creek the moon the sun and then leaned a little bit and said they would call them skinwalkers old warriors Resurrected as skinless men, walking on deer legs with the torso of a man and the head of a coyote, but they were messed up, long and disfigured, teeth like a bowie knife, long arms and standing seven feet tall, even hunched over. They would gut the old cowboys and white riders, they'll run through the bullets part the Spanish armor like it was a potato sack and boy could they change their voice to match a person you knew or might know and that's what I saw big and fast only for a second it ran across the road gray and molted muscle flexing under its legs clumping on the road stringy muscle hunched shoulders and it turned, looked right into the cab, and looked at me, right into my eyes. And I swear, I swear, it grinned at me. I sank into my seat. In fear, shaking, I knew my death was coming. I smelled ozone and brimstone. The air felt like right before the lightning comes, and blows a tree to smithereens charged and full with power. I yelled for Pa, but no words came out, just a dry squeak. I started to shake as my grandfather told his story. He was still here, so I knew he lived. But the supernatural always fascinated me, and even now, I felt the force of his words. The real power of skinwalkers was trickery, sure. They could change their voices, but also their skin. That's why the gods took their hide, so they could take others. Not for long, the legend says, maybe an hour, before the soul of the skin that they were wearing would come looking for their mortal shell before going to whatever hell awaited them. Even though I think that getting skinned alive was hell enough, a minute passed in what felt like a lifetime, one second in one thousand years. My father's door opened, and I jerked my head to the left, putting up my hands to fend off an attack. Son, it's me, my father said. Before climbing into the cab, he got the steering wheel and pulled himself in an awkward way, jerking himself into the seat. I cringed into the corner. I looked at him. I looked hard. Your great-grandfather was a good man, treated me and my mom right. He fought the Nazis and saw the worst of man in Poland when he freed all those camps. And now, I was taking his measure. Is this my father? Do I make a run? Or do I die? Is it him or not? Let's go get that medicine for your mom as he pulled the truck into gear and pulled it out into the road and our trip resumed I guess it was him after all but how did you know? was it because he said something about your mom? I knew because out the window out the corner of my eye I saw that same beast running 50 miles an hour right next to our car looking at me with those yellow eyes and grinning mouth I looked and saw it, hunched and angry, running next to us. My pa kept his eyes on the road, 
looking straight ahead. Son, he said, don't look at it. That's how I knew it was my dad. He knew what to do. And he kept telling me to just keep looking straight ahead and to not look at whatever was around us running. He then told me that by acknowledging its presence, you give it power. That's where my grandfather finished the story. I kept staring at him, but by this time, he was just looking straight ahead, looking around me, and said we should go inside. As we went inside the house, he then told me to not ever mention skinwalkers. He also said that speaking their name out loud or mentioning them at all, even in text, even in stories, even if someone else is telling you a story, is supposed to make them aware of your existence. Do you love Native American legends? Have you heard of the goat man? No? Then please, allow me to enlighten you. I heard the legend when a power outage on our reservation made us decide to have a fire. As we all know, nothing goes better with a good fire than a good story. That's where I learned about the goat man. The legend goes that they shapeshift. They love human forms most of all, which is what makes them so dangerous. It's also said that if you find a bone of one, take a picture and keep it in your house, it will wait. For what though, you may ask? The answer is they wait for you to leave. Once you leave, they ransack the place until they find what you took from them. There was even an incident about that night that I heard of, where some people met the goat man face to face. It was a night like the one I was experiencing. Some men had decided to have a fire in the desert and they told some stories about it. Then a stranger walked out of the desert and took a seat, never speaking a word. No one really got a good look at the stranger. One man brought up the legend of the goat man, causing the stranger to listen a little more closely. At the end, the other men nervously laughed, and the stranger stayed silent. The men decided to go back to their homes and put out the fire. They didn't have enough room for the stranger, and they figured he could hitchhike back to town. They had just left when they saw something chasing after their truck. Afraid, they sped up, and the creature sped up its pursuit as well. When it reached the truck, it flipped over and dragged three men off into the night. What happened to them? Well, they were never found. So here I am to warn you and to be careful of the goat man. They can shapeshift, didn't I tell you? That homeless man begging for change that you encounter on your way home tonight could be one or your boss teacher or even your friends.